Let's pray. <sighs> Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you in the name above every name, that beautiful name of Yeshua. And we thank you that through that name, Yeshua, that we are saved, that we are delivered, that we don't have to bear the weight and the consequence for our own sin that we deserve because we deserve your wrath. But we thank you that through your son, our Messiah, that we can have deliverance through his blood and that it is by your grace that we are saved. And so we just come before you in thanksgiving for that. And know that, Lord, we need you. We desperately need you. We need your Holy Spirit right now to speak to each one of our hearts. You said you spent, sent the Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to lead us into all truth. And so I pray that you would open up our spiritual eyes right now to understand your word, to understand your truth, that we may live and walk in victory over the adversary. So we just ask you right now, just to come and to move and have your way in us. In Yeshua's name, amen. All right. Do you have your Bibles? Let me see. Everybody hold up your Bible if you have your Bible. Okay, you can go ahead and open up to Ephesians 6. Just be ready. We're going to be starting in verse 10. Let's just go ahead and, and open up and read that passage together. Ephesians 6, we're going to read verses 10 through the end. Okay, we've been going over this the last couple weeks. We slowed down a little bit because this is critical, critical truth that we need to apply to our lives. Ephesians 6, verse 10. For the rest, my brothers, be strong in the master and the mightiness of his strength. Put on the complete armor of Elohim for you to have power to stand against the schemes of the devil. Because we do not wrestle or struggle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. Because of this, take up the complete armor of Elohim so that you have power to withstand in the wicked day and having done all to stand. Stand then, having girded your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having fitted your feet with the preparation of the good news of peace. Above all, having taken up the shield of belief with which you shall have power to quench all the burning arrows of the wicked one. Take also the helmet of deliverance and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times with all prayer and supplication, in the spirit, watching in all perseverance and supplication for all the set apart ones. Also for me, that a word might be given to me in the opening of my mouth to be bold in making known the secret of the good news for which I am an envoy in chains that in it I might speak boldly as I should speak. Now, in order that you also might know about me, how I'm doing to Kikos, a beloved brother and trustworthy servant in the master shall make all matters known to you, whom I did send to you for this same purpose, so that you know about us and might encourage your hearts. Peace to you, brothers, and love with belief from Elohim the Father and the Master Yeshua Messiah. Favor be with all those who love our Master Yeshua Messiah undecayingly. Amen. All right. So today is going to be the last message of Ephesians. So we've been in this book for a while, probably about six or seven months, and it's been a great journey. But today is going to be the end of the series on Ephesians, although it's not going to be the end on the series on spiritual warfare. We're going to continue this series because my heart and my desire is to really equip you to know how to walk in victory and overcome the enemy. Now, as I previously shared in 2008 and 2009, I led an infantry platoon on the streets of Iraq. And it was a great experience. I learned a lot. 
Now, to be effective before I left, the military equipped me and my men with all of the body armor and military weapons that we needed to successfully engage the enemy. So you see up there, I had my M4 rifle, I had my handgun, there's guys in my platoon that had hand grenades, all of our vehicles were equipped with a 50 caliber machine gun, which if you haven't seen one of those fire, it is very impressive. We even had bayonet knives, for, you know, for close hand-to-hand -hand combat, but the point was, is we knew we were going into battle, so the military equipped us with the weapons that we needed to be successful in battle. Now, each of the weapons that I had was different. They all were different. They had different purposes. But to be effective in combat, I had to know both how to use each weapon and also know when to use each weapon. Well, that required a lot of training, right? It required a lot of training and practice before we went into battle so that when we engaged the enemy, when things started blowing up, because they did, we need to be, already be trained so that we could just react, that we didn't have to think about, okay, well, how do I load this gun again? How do I, you know, throw this hand grenade? We didn't need to think about how to do it. We could just react and it could come without thinking. And I remember there were situations where, you know, things started blowing up and it was just, it was almost surreal because everything just went clear in my head and I just started like, you know, giving orders and positioning people. And I didn't really have to think about it. It was all that training. It just kicked in. Some of you may be in emergency medical services or other um, situations like that where your training just kicks in in that moment where things get very stressful. Well, all of that came back to the training and the practice before going into battle. Well, obviously, I'm not in Iraq anymore. And none of you are in Iraq. Anybody headed there anytime soon? Okay, good. Well, that's probably a good thing. Well, we're not in a actual physical battle or physical war, but we are all in a spiritual battle. And so we need to be equipped in order to successfully engage the enemy, successfully stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And we've been talking about that. And that is the first point. So let's just take a, a moment to review kind of where we've come from. The first point is that you are in a spiritual battle. And for some of you, that's the biggest thing you need to take away today is just recognizing the spiritual battle that you're in because as you struggle, because we struggle in life, and some of the struggles that we have are because of a spiritual battle that is manifesting in a physical world. So we are in a spiritual battle. And oftentimes, when we're in battle, which can come through relational conflict, right? And that often the, the battle that we're, the struggle that we have is in those relationships, or sometimes it's the internal conflict. Well, as we're going through those conflicts, as we're in that battle, we need to realize that the enemy is not other people. Other people are not your enemy, yes, it is other people that say things. It is other people that do things. But other people are not your enemy. And the other thing is you are not your own enemy. One of Satan's greatest tactics, and it works on all of us at times, is to convince us that other people are our enemy. And when we believe another person is our enemy, then we're going to start accusing them or retaliating against them. So we have to be aware of the spiritual battle that is raging in our families, in our marriages, in our workplace. So we don't fight according to the flesh, but they, we use those spiritual weapons, knowing that we are in a spiritual battle. Because all of these responses towards other people, they cause division. And we, right? I mean, all of you feel that from time to time, right? That you are in a relational conflict, and that when we act out in the flesh, we say that thing that maybe we know we shouldn't say, that it creates division. 
doesn't bring about the reconciliation that God calls us to, but it brings about division, which is exactly what the enemy wants. But it all comes back to believing this, this belief that the other people are our enemy. But other people are not our enemy. What did we just read? We read in 6 verse 12, because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Our enemy is Satan and his kingdom. It says, but against principalities, against authorities, against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. So our enemy is Satan in his kingdom. And the primary way that he influences us is in our thoughts. I was just talking to somebody this week. And they were saying, yeah, sometimes I'm driving down the road and just I'll have the, the craziest thoughts or like evil thoughts. I'm like, where did that come from? That's not like, I don't think like that. Where did that thought come from? Anybody ever have thoughts? You're just like, where did that come from? Like out of nowhere? Well, that's not your own thought. The enemy can give us thoughts. And that's the primary way he influences us because he wants us to come into agreement with those thoughts and act on those thoughts. And so in order to overcome in your struggle, whatever it is that you're going through or whatever it is that you're going to go through, we have to have discernment of our thoughts. And one of the helpful tools looking back at Genesis 3 in the garden is to ask the question, who told you that certain thought? Right? And that way God asked Eve, Adam and Eve, who told you you are naked? So that is a question that is helpful for us to be able to discern our thoughts. Well, who said that was true? Is that what God says? Is that what his word says? And if we don't recognize where our thoughts come from, then we're not going to know how to use the spiritual weapons of warfare that we've been given. And that's where it begins. If we don't have discernment of our thoughts, then everything else that I'm going to share today is really not going to be helpful for you. So we have to have discernment of our thoughts. We need to be able to recognize when we're having thoughts from the enemy or when we're having thoughts from God or when maybe there are our own thoughts. So let's make this personal. In previous messages, I've asked you to really consider what are you struggling with right now? And I hope you have, that you've taken time to think about, you know, what am I struggling with right now? What, what's going on in my life that's hard, that I, that really weighs on my mind, that, that is heavy to me? You know, write those things down. What are you struggling with? And then with each one of those struggles, we have thoughts. We're thinking about these things, right? We're always thinking. Guys say that we have our nothing box, but we really don't have a nothing box. We're always thinking about something. Right. So what thoughts have you had in your struggle? Where do those thoughts come from? You know, who told you those things? Examine your thoughts. Think about what you're thinking about. And what lies have you heard in your thoughts? You know, as you start doing an examination of your thoughts, especially these reoccurring thoughts, Like, ask the question, is that true? Is what I'm thinking about and meditating on true? I can tell you when Katie and I are in conflict, it's like I have, I'm flooded with thoughts, but then I have to back up and say, is that true? Does she really intend that thing that she said? Is she really intending evil towards me? I don't think so, but that's what the enemy wants to tell me. Is that true? So you have to recognize the lies that are going through our mind. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. If we want to walk in victory over the enemy in our daily lives and accomplish God's purpose for our lives, then we must be able to discern our thoughts and recognize the lies that we hear from the enemy. Now, I know this is a little heavy, but it should not discourage us. We shouldn't be discouraged. We shouldn't be afraid. Because through the work of Messiah, and that is the good news, through the work of Messiah, 
on the cross and the blood that he shed for you and for me, you have been given the power to stand. You have been given the power to overcome the enemy. You're not enslaved to him anymore. You were bought with a price. I think it's Colossians 1 says you were delivered from the authority of darkness. So we're not victims. And we can't live like victims to our circumstances. We can walk in victory because of what Messiah has done for us. Verse 13 says, because of this, so because of the spiritual battle that we are in, take up the complete armor of God so that you have power to withstand in the wicked day and having done all to stand. So what word is repeated over and over? Stand. That is like, if you think about some of the war moves you see, that's like you're in your fighting position and you're holding back the enemy. This isn't necessarily a call to, you know, run into the line of fire and to engage the enemy directly, but it's a call to stand your ground and strongly resist the enemy. And our strength, our ability to walk in victory and to overcome the struggle, it doesn't depend on our own strength. Because we're weak. I mean, come on. We are weak. You know, you think about the verse, my, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We are very weak. So our strength to walk in victory, our power and our ability to walk in victory and to overcome does not depend on our own strength but on the strength of Messiah. What does Galatians 2.20 say? I have been crucified with Messiah. That's death. I have died. It's no longer I who live, but Messiah who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we must recognize our own weakness and insufficiency and choose to abide in Messiah, and choose to depend on His strength to overcome. That would be a great prayer to start your day with. Lord, I know that I'm weak. I'm insufficient. I don't have what it takes. Empty me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit and strengthen me in my inner man, like Ephesians 3 says, so that I might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's where victory and overcoming begins. So in addition, he has given us a complete set of spiritual armor to stand firm against the advances of the enemy. And we talked about that two weeks ago, that complete set of armor. And one thing we're going to provide next week, so I would encourage you to come back, is we're going to be making a little battle book, okay? I'm all about the practical. So we're gonna be handing out these little battle books that have scriptures associated with each piece of the armor and a prayer associated with that, that you can pray on that piece of armor and just get your mind focused on the truth of what God says about you. So come back and, and so that you have that. And we're going to be able to add to it as we go through this series on spiritual warfare because we want to equip you to walk in victory. So last week we talked about the defensive set of armor. And this week we're going to talk about the offensive spiritual weapons. So last week we talked about armor. This week we're going to talk about weapons. 2 Corinthians 10, 3, and 4 Kind of a reiterating Ephesians 6, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in God. And of course, the verse continues, but the question I have is, what are those weapons? What are those spiritual weapons that the Lord has given us to overcome, to cast down those thoughts, to tear down those strongholds. We need to know what those weapons are, and then we need to know how to use those weapons to overcome in your struggle. 
So I'm going to list off five of these weapons, and we're going to talk about two of them. So, of course, from Ephesians 6, we know that we have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That is a weapon that we have to fight in spiritual warfare. We have prayer, right? Sometimes when we're reading the armor of God, we stop after sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Well, it keeps going. There's a comma there. The, ver- the sentence continues. Prayer is a spiritual weapon that we have. We also have fasting. You think about when Yeshua told his disciples that you can't cast that demon out except by prayer and fasting. So fasting is a spiritual weapon we have. We have praise and worship. That's a weapon that we have to declare praise to our God through song. And then we have the blood of Yeshua. The blood of Yeshua. I'd encourage you to read Revelation 12, 10, and 11. But verse 11 says, They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. So the blood of Yeshua is a weapon that we have. But today we're going to talk about the sword of the Spirit and prayer. So to be effective, for us to be effective in our daily lives, In spiritual warfare, we must know how to use these weapons, how to use the sword of the Spirit, how to use prayer to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. It's not enough, and this is so important, it's not enough just to have facts about them. I'm sure many of you could do an amazing teaching on prayer, but there's a difference between being able to teach on prayer or teach the Word of God and actually walk it out. There's many people in the academic circles and beyond that know far more than I do about the Bible, but they're not walking in faith. So it's not enough just to know about these things. We need to know how to use them in spiritual warfare. Now, if I stood up here and I told you everything you need to know about the M4 carbine rifle, Everything you and everything you know, and I take it to, gave you a test, you pass the test with flying colors. How many of you from, with just that information would feel equipped to walk into a war zone and use this weapon effectively? Okay, we have a couple, all right, that would feel confident. Let me know how that goes for you. Of course not, because it's not enough just to know about the weapon. You need to know how to use the weapon. Now, many of us know the Word of God because you're sitting under good teaching. And I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about a lot of you sit under teachings of Dr. Brooke Corman and Tom Bradford and others, really excellent Bible teachers. So you know the Word of God. You've been studying it for a lot of your life. And I'm sure many of you, if we did some Bible trivia, that you would take me to school. But... The question is, do you know how to use the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, in spiritual warfare? We may be able to quote a lot of Scripture, but do we know how to use it in spiritual warfare? So that's one of the purposes that I have for this series, is to equip you with the truth from God's Word so that you can walk in victory over the enemy and accomplish God's mission for your life. I want to live as an overcomer. Revelation 2 and 3, over and over, to them who overcome, to them who overcome. That's what it's about. It's about overcoming. After this series, I want to equip you so that you can effectively use these weapons of warfare to overcome the attacks of the enemy and to walk in victory. I want you to be able to recognize when the enemy gives you a thought, and to be able to resist and combat that thought with the truth of what God's Word says. So you can walk in victory. Because that's what we've been called to, is to walk as overcomers, live as overcomers, and to walk in victory. So let's talk about these weapons, these spiritual weapons that the Lord has given us to overcome the schemes of the devil. The first one is the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. He has given us the most powerful weapon in the universe. 
And a lot of times that's not how I think about my Bible, not how I think about Scripture. But he has given us the most powerful weapon in all the universe. And the same word, the same word that spoke the universe into existence and that holds all things together is the same word that you hold in your hands. It's the same word. What is Psalm 119? Let's just look at a few scriptures. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, or forever, O Jehovah, your word stands firm in the heavens. His word is eternal. Psalm 33, 4 through 6. For the word of Jehovah is straight and all his works are in truth. Loving righteousness and right ruling, the earth is filled with the loving commit, uh, commitment of Jehovah. By the word of Jehovah, the heavens were made, and all the host by the spirit of his mouth. Just meditate on that. That is unbelievable. Second Timothy three sixteen and 17 says, let's read this one together. All right. All scripture is breathed out by Elohim and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for setting straight, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim might be fitted, equipped for every good work. All scripture is breathed out by God. So, yes, it is powerful. Hebrews 4.12, and this is a direct connection to our passage in Ephesians 6. For the word of Elohim is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through even to the dividing of soul and spirit, or being and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So the word of God that we hold in our hands, it is powerful, it is authoritative, and it is effective in defeating the lies of the enemy. So it's not enough just to know about God's word. We need to be able to use God's word in spiritual warfare to defeat the enemy because it has the power. My words don't have power. Aaron's words are powerless. His word is powerful. So again, do you know how to wield this sword in spiritual warfare? Well, Yeshua gave us a case study. He showed us how to use the word of God to, to defeat the temptation and the lies of the enemy. So let's just turn together to Matthew 4, 1 through 11. And let's get some insight from Yeshua on how to defeat the enemy with the word of God. Ephesians 4, 1 through 11. Then Yeshua was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tried by the devil. And after having fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the trier came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these, breads be, these stones become bread. But he answering said, It has been written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Jehovah. Then the devil took him up to the set-apart city, set him on the edge of the set-apart place, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it has been written, He shall command his messengers concerning you. In their hands they shall bear you up, so that you do not dash your foot against a stone. Yeshua said to him, It has also been written, You shall not try Jehovah your Elohim. 
Again, the devil took him up on a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these I shall give to you if you fall down and worship me. Then Yeshua said to him, go, Satan, for it has been written, you shall worship Jehovah your Elohim and him alone you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and see, messengers came and attended to him. So I just want to draw out just a few insights from this passage so that we can feel equipped to do what Yeshua did and declare God's word to overcome the temptation of the enemy. So first, the enemy came to Yeshua to tempt him when he was physically weak. Right, You notice that he had been fasting for 40 days, so he was spiritually strong, but he was physically weak. And that's oftentimes when the enemy comes to tempt us. When we're sick, tired, hangry, all of those things. That's when the enemy comes to tempt us, when we are physically weak, because we're such fleshly creatures. Now, the enemy also was attacking his identity. Do you notice that? If you are the son of God. He was attacking his identity because you saw there in the passage that ultimately it is Satan that wanted to be worshipped. It isn't that, I think, Isaiah 14, what led to the fall in in the first place? It's because he wanted that glory. He wanted to be higher than God. So he's telling the son of God, fall down and worship me. I want you to also notice that the enemy knows what the word says. He probably knows what it says better than I do. He knows what the written word says, but he does not submit to it. He does not walk in faith. He does not walk in obedience to it but he knows what the word says. And he may use the word of God to accuse you and to bring guilt or shame upon you, but it's always going to be absent of grace. But he knows the word of God. And so just be careful. He's he's a sneaky snake. He's very deceptive. So how did Yeshua respond? First of all, off, obviously Yeshua recognized that those thoughts, that voice was coming from the enemy. And he declared the written word of God. He didn't say, do you know who I am? What are you doing? No, he just simply declared the written word of God. And he walked in obedience to it. So when you're casting down a thought. You recognize you're getting a thought from the enemy. It's not enough just to think about a scripture because I don't believe the enemy can read your thoughts. I think he can give you thoughts. I don't think he can read your thoughts. So we need to be declaring the word of God out loud, even if you're by yourself. I was doing it this week, declaring out loud what the word says. And then Finally, we see here that Yeshua commanded the enemy to leave. And he did. But he was standing on the authority that was given to him, but the authority of the word of God. And that is also important. And that's something we're going to be talking about in future weeks. When you recognize that the enemy has given you a thought and you take it captive You can renounce it and command him to go. We have that authority. James 4, 7 says, So then subject yourselves to Elohim, resist the devil, and he shall flee from you. So that's what we see from Yeshua. He was subjected to God, to the Father. He resisted the temptation of the enemy and commanded him to go, and he did. So I want you to really think about how this applies to whatever struggle you're going through. You know, to really consider what are you struggling with right now? And how, what lessons can you take 
from Matthew 4, 1 through 11, and how Yeshua dealt with his spiritual battle. Just to really consider, you know, what lies have you heard from the enemy? And it may sound a lot like the truth, because a lie is just a little bit off. It may sound a lot like the truth, but you got to recognize it for what it is. And then, like Yeshua just showed us, be able to speak and declare the truth from God's Word. And I think Ephesians, well, I know it is. I don't just think it is. I know it is. It's full of the truth about who we are and how we walk out our faith. So just taking some time this week as we conclude the study of Ephesians to read back through, and maybe there's a scripture that would be really helpful for you to begin declaring to overcome the lies that you have heard from the enemy. So it's so important that we recognize what we're struggling with, what are those lies, and then what is the truth. And that's what Yeshua did. He was able to come back with the truth of what God's Word says with each lie and temptation of the enemy. I know Katie, especially, she's better at this than I am. She journals a lot, and she writes these things down. When she has these thoughts, she will write them down, and I've started doing it as well. Like, what am I hearing? What am I really believing? And then you're able to kind of get objective and look at that and be like, well, I know that's not true, so what is the truth? And then you write out scriptures, and then you have those ready. So when that thought comes back, you can reply with the truth of what God's Word says about who you are, who He's made you to be. So the first weapon that we have available to us is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. The next weapon we have is not often thought of as a weapon, but it is, and that's prayer. How many of you think about prayer as a weapon? I mean, some of you probably do. It's a little, it was kind of like, you know what? That is a weapon. That is a weapon we had. Now, when I was over in Iraq and we were in combat, I used a very effective weapon to defeat the enemy. And it wasn't my M4 rifle. It wasn't a 50 caliber. It wasn't my handgun. What was it? (laughs) Prayer is the right answer, but more practically, it was my radio. It was my radio. So anytime we came under attack, my very first step was to get on my radio, to call my commander, to call the tactical operations center and say, hey, we're under fire. Just let him know as briefly as possible what's going on so that he was aware and he could start dispatching resources to come and help us, right? He could send additional soldiers. He could send my favorite, which were helicopters. Those were the best. When you start getting the helicopters shoving overhead and you get on the radio with them and they've got eyes in the sky, it was great. We also have precision artillery rockets. We have tons of weapons, but my commander would not know how to help my platoon if he didn't know I was under attack. So I had to communicate with my commander using my radio to tell him we are under attack. And that was truly the advantage that we had over the enemy in combat. Was our radios, was our ability to communicate and dispatch resources to overwhelm and overpower the enemy. Well, I would suggest that in spiritual warfare, our our overwhelming advantage against the enemy is prayer. Now, going back to Ephesians Six, let's look at verse 18. It says this. It says, praying at all times with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So we are called to pray at all times. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, do not worry at all. And the enemy often will give us anxious thoughts. And we're going to talk more about that next week. He says, do not worry at all, but in every matter by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Call him, reach out to him, talk to him. And there's a promise here. It says, and the peace or the shalom of Elohim, which surpasses 
all understanding shall guard your hearts and your minds through Messiah Yeshua. When it says it'll guard your hearts and your minds, do you know that's military language? If you can imagine two fully equipped soldiers standing at a fortress in front of the gate saying, nuh-uh, you ain't getting by here. That's what the image is. It says the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds when we pray. And we have to remember that we don't serve the U.S. Army. We serve the King of Kings and the Master of the Universe who owns all things, who has authority over all things, who knows all things. And yes, he knows what we need before we ask. But he's telling us to pray, to call to him so he can dispatch reinforcements to guard your heart and your mind. And there's lots of different things he can do. And I'm sure many of you, when you prayed, you have seen an answer to that prayer almost immediately, whether it's someone picking up the phone and calling you. How many of you have ever called somebody, say, you know what, you were on my mind. And I just want you to know I'm praying for you, and you encourage them. How many of you have ever done that? And then they say, you know what, your call was perfect timing because I'm really struggling with this. I know it's happened to both of us. Or somebody will call you. Hey, you're on your mind. I just want you to know I'm praying for you. And that is, it's like confirmation to know that the Lord knows what you need. And when we pray, we can have confidence that he will dispatch those resources to help us in our time of need. So that is a truly effective weapon that we have in warfare. Proverbs 15, 29 says, Jehovah is far from the wrong ones, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. How many of you are in a covenant relationship with Yeshua? Raise your hand. You have been declared righteous. And so he hears your prayers. Now, are there certain things that we can do to, to cause him to not hear our prayers? Yes. But he hears your prayers because you have been declared righteous. And prayer really shows, it shows a dependence on God and a submission to his word. Just like, you know, when our kids come to us and they ask for help. That is a, it just warms our hearts. And oftentimes we already know that they need help. But when they come and ask for it, it's just showing that dependence on us and that submission to us. But I will say that prayer and reading the word are two things the enemy does not want you to do. And he tries very hard to keep you from doing them. How many of you feel resistance that you cannot explain when you go into prayer or to reading the word? You think that's your own psychology? I don't think it is. It may have something to do with it, but I think that is the enemy seeking to oppress you, to keep you from prayer, keep you from reading the word. Why? Because they have power and authority. Prayer has power. The word has authority. And when we use them together, they defeat the enemy. Two highly effective weapons that we have. So when we pray, we should pray the word of God. You notice here in Ephesians 6, it says, praying at all times with all prayer in the Spirit. Well, when you pray in the Spirit, pray using the sword of the Spirit. Do you see the connection between the sword of the Spirit and praying in the Spirit? So I believe one of the primary ways we can pray in the Spirit is when we pray the Word of God. Because that's how we know that we're praying God's will. How many of you want to pray God's will? Yeah, of course you do. But when we're praying out of our own heart, out of our own mind, sometimes I don't think we do pray God's will. Sometimes we do. But when we pray the word and we declare God's truth, we know that we're praying his will. 
So I can say when I'm struggling, when I recognize the thoughts that I'm having from the enemy, I just start praying out loud. I start calling for help. I'm just talking to my father, just like I would call my earthly dad on the phone. Hey, dad, I'm struggling. Can we talk about this? It doesn't have to be scripted in any certain way. We just reach out to the Lord. Father, I'm struggling. I need help. I need help right now. I tell him what I'm hearing. I tell him what I've been believing, and I ask for his help to help me overcome in that moment. And then oftentimes, he will give me a scripture. Some scripture will come to my mind, and I'll just start declaring that scripture out loud. Now, recently, I was feeling a little overwhelmed by all of my responsibilities. Now, for all these stories, you guys will be like, man, you're always struggling. I'm like, well, maybe I am, but at least I admit it. I was feeling a little overwhelmed by all of my responsibilities. You know, we're still kind of getting our feet under us with four children, and we want to do it right. And when you really try to do family right, it's hard because you really have to die to yourself. And, you know, I want to lead well in the fellowship. I want to shepherd well. I was feeling a little overwhelmed, and I was thinking, man, I don't, I don't have what it takes to get all these things done, to do this well. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. Well, when I recognized the, the lies that I was hearing, because that certainly wasn't coming from God, I started praying out loud. And the Spirit brought this scripture in my mind. It's 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 says, He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, then, I shall rather boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Messiah rests on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses and insults and needs and persecutions and distresses for the sake of Messiah. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So I... One of the reasons why I love Lester is because he just always reminds me that I'm completely incapable and insufficient. (laughs) And I really appreciate that, right? Yeah, he's shaking his head back there. Because I am. And I think the sooner that we come to grips with that, that the better off we're going to be. Because we're going to be dependent on Messiah. We're going to be dependent on his Holy Spirit. We're not going to try to do it on our own. We're going to be dependent on His strength, His power, His Holy Spirit. I really think that's what it means to walk by the Spirit, to wake up in the morning and say, I don't have what it takes. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I need you, Lord. So please lead me by your Holy Spirit. Give me the thoughts to think today. Show me what you want me to do today. I need your help. So that's just an example when we recognize those thoughts, to begin to pray, and then as he brings a scripture to your mind, or maybe one you already have, begin declaring that scripture, declare the truth over your mind, over your life. So prayer and the word of God should always be used together to defeat the works of the enemy. Should always be used together. Now let's continue in the second half of verse 18. It says, We'll start at the beginning of verse 18. Praying at all times with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching in all perseverance and supplication for all the holy ones. Also for me, that a word might be given to me and opening of my mouth to be bold in making known the secret of the good news for which I am an envoy in chains, that in it I might speak boldly as I should speak. Here's what I want you to recognize. And all this talk in spiritual warfare, we've talked a lot about kind of your individual tactics, if you will, like individual strategy for overcoming the enemy, you know, recognizing where you struggle, recognizing the thoughts you're having, knowing when, you know, there's lies coming to your mind, declaring the truth. But here's also what I want you to know, based on these verses, you're not alone. You're not alone in spiritual warfare. You're not alone. Now, in actual combat, 
the U.S. Army's strength doesn't come because Aaron was particularly talented or strong. Our strength came from our numbers. And in the military, we're taught from day one in basic training four warrior ethos. And the last one is I will never leave a fallen comrade. Teaching you to be there for one another, to fight for one another. So in spiritual warfare, it's not hard, but we are not alone. We have each other. We have each other. And that's why Katie and I so much want to just grow the fellowship and the community here in this place so that you really know each other. You don't just know about each other. You don't just aren't familiar with each other. You really know each other. So you know how to pray for one another. And because we're not alone, we can use these same weapons, the Word of God and prayer, to fight for each other. To fight for each other. We can declare the truth of God's Word to one another. I know that's what Katie does to me. That's what Lester does for me. When I start having stinking thinking, because I do, then they can remind me of the truth. And that's what it takes sometimes as someone else to just listen and be like, well, is that true? That may be what you believe or what you're hearing. Is that true? What does God's word say? So we can declare the word of God over each other and we can pray for one another. We can pray for each other. James 5, 13 through 16, saying, is any of you suffering evil? That's been my question. What are you struggling with? Let him pray. Is anyone in good spirits? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the assembly and let them pray over him, having anointed him with oil in the name of the master. Call us if you're sick. Sometimes I find out three or four days after someone goes in the hospital. I want to know like immediately so I can pray for them and find a time to go visit. So call us, but we can also pray for each other. And the prayer of the belief shall save the sick, and the master shall raise him up. And if any has committed sins, he shall be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another so that you are healed. The earnest prayer of the righteous one accomplishes much. So be encouraged to pray but also to pray for one another, to declare the truth over one another. And as Paul concludes this letter, he asks, he gives a prayer request. He says, will you pray for me that I have boldness to proclaim the good news, the secret of the good news? That was his whole mission. That's what this letter is all about, him revealing the secret of the good news. So he's asking for prayer, to have boldness, to proclaim that. Well, all of us have a mission and a purpose from God. So we need to be praying for one another. That we would carry out that mission and the purpose that God has for us. Because here's the truth. Is when you start seeking the Lord and seeking to do his will and seeking to carry out his purposes, that's when the enemy's going to attack. And that's when we're going to need to be to pray for each other. If you feel like, you know what, I'm good. I'm good. Really not struggling. Everything's good. Praise the Lord. But if that's always the way it is and you, there's never any assaults in the enemy, that's concerning. It, I mean, it is. I mean, I feel like, you know, the, the last year or so since we've been here has been wonderful. It's been good. You all have been so good to us, but it's been hard because the enemy's not happy about us being here. So he's been attacking us in a lot of different ways. But we have the tools, we have the weapons of warfare that we need to overcome. And I try to make these messages really practical 
so that you can take what you hear and actually apply it to your life and you can walk out the door and you give that thought and you know, oh, that's not my thought. And you declare scripture and you pray or you call someone. So you can begin to live and walk as overcomers. So let's just make it practical again. On the back of your the back of your notes, you have these questions. And I know that's a lot of questions. And you may not be able to answer them all right now. That's okay. But take some time to go through these questions. I think it would be very, very helpful. So what are you struggling with right now? You know, what thoughts have you had? Writing down those thoughts. You know, what lies among those thoughts? What lies have you heard from the enemy? And sometimes those lies don't come into your own thoughts, but they come through another person. So sometimes you may be just thinking about what somebody else said to you. Well, maybe the enemy spoke through that person, spoke a lie, and you're just replaying that in your mind. So recognize that lie. And then don't overwhelm yourself. What is one scripture? What's one scripture that you can use to cast down that thought, that lie, and pray over yourself? and declare of yourself. What's one scripture? Pray. Just ask the Lord. He'll give you a scripture. Read back through Ephesians. There's lots of them. And then, who's praying for you? Who knows you well enough? Who are you being honest with? That you can pick up the phone and you can say, hey, I'm struggling. And they just start praying for you. If you're married, I pray to God that you have that with your spouse. But we need that from other people too. So who is praying for you? Who are you being honest with? And then, who is one other person that you know who's struggling? Do you know other people's struggles? Do you know what other people are going through? And then what is one scripture you can pray over them and share with them? Because we can battle together. That's where our strength is. Is when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, when we're strengthened with His vast strength, and we do it together, then we are going to overcome. So I would encourage you to both reach out to other people, ask them to pray for you, to pray with you, but also to pray for others to know them well enough to know how we can be praying for them. I'm looking around, and I know a lot of you, and I know what you're going through. So I can be praying for you, but we need to be knowing each other as well so that we can pray for one another. So we're just going to take some time now. We're just going to ask the Holy Spirit just to come and speak to each one of your hearts and to show you the answers to these questions to help you begin to process And then to bring to your mind the truth so you can begin meditating on the truth of what God's word says and defeat the lies of the enemy. So Katie, Lester, and Deanna are going to play for us, and this is going to be our time. So Father, we come before you in the name of Yeshua, and we thank you that you do not just leave us helpless in the battle, but that you have given us weapons of warfare to defeat the enemy, to stand firm, against the schemes of the devil. So I pray right now in Yeshua's name that you would encourage each one of our hearts. Lord, give us discernment of our thoughts. Help us to understand what lies we've been believing, what thoughts have been going through our head that are not true. They're not from you. And to bring to our minds truth from your word that we may begin to declare your word out loud over ourselves and over each other. We want to be that people that hears, well done, my good and faithful servant. We want to be those people that are overcomers. So help us right now, not just to be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. And we thank you that it is all made possible through your Son, our Messiah, Yeshua. 
And in his name we pray. Amen.